starting off today, I wanted to take a short moment to reflect on something I listened to just a few days ago. You see, as a podcaster and as a history buff, I'm always listening to new shows. And last week, it was Written in Blood History, a show produced by Stephen DeJulius. His past two episodes have been an exploration of the life and times of the famed World War II general George S. Patton, a biography worthy of a podcast if ever there was one. Listening to Stephen tell this story, it's crazy to find out that one of the strongest battlefield generals of all time was a dyslexic who got into college through the strength of his father's ties and his family's pedigree, nepotism in action. It was also interesting to learn that Patton's relatives fought on the side of the Confederacy less than 80 years before he took charge of the Third Army and ran across France with his tanks, with both his grandfather and his great-uncle dying in that earlier war. In that sense, it really brings to light just how young the U.S. is as a nation. I mean, think about it. We're about as far removed right now from Patton, the American war hero portrayed in film and whose name is splashed all over army buildings, and of course, on an old version of the U.S. tank, as Patton was to his grandfather, the Confederate colonel, who chose to turn his back on his country. Those ties are just not that long. While all of this is certainly interesting, and I recommend Stevens Written in Blood wholeheartedly, it's the more distant links that are more relevant to us here at TNM. In that sense, to hear Stephen talking about Calais and Ross, the Moselle River and the Rhine, and talking about them as significant places in the history of the 20th century really served to drive home for me that, while the players may change, the stage that history plays out on basically remains the same. These same areas that Patton drove across were fought over by Clovis. They were areas in which Brunhilde and Fredegunda led armies against one another. And they set this scene for today's story. Bear in mind as we go through the next 28 minutes that the same rivers that flow through France and Germany and that stopped the flow of armies 75 years ago were the same ones that served to slow assaults between tribes in the early Middle Ages. Crossing these rivers was seen as a major advance in World War II, and it was seen as encroaching into enemy territory 1,300 years before that. And in both the case of General Patton and King Clothar II, bold maneuvers and a sense of invulnerability in battle, which, if we wrote about them in fiction, would be decried as gratuitous and unrealistic plot armor, would combine to change the course of these battles. With that in mind, let's get into today's story. Clothar II was tired. By the year 622, he'd been in power as king for 38 years, and in fact, he'd never really known a day of his life when he wasn't the king. Born in 584, he'd been the crown prince of Neustria for only about six months before his father, Chilperic, died. The elder monarch had been stabbed while hunting. He was getting off of a horse when an unknown assailant stabbed him under the arm and in the stomach. Some claimed that Fredegunda, The king's wife had planned this after she accidentally let slip the name of her lover, Landry, when the king walked up behind her unexpectedly in her bedroom. This was never proven, but people do love gossip. At any rate, Clothar started his kingship under the regency of Fredegunda. Whether she was in control as the result of a random assassination that she had no role in planning, or was there because her lover felt the urgent need to end the king before the king ended them. She sat the throne for well over a decade. She had expanded the borders of Nustria significantly during her reign, but by the time she died and Clothar fully assumed the responsibilities of kingship, his was still a small kingdom in the overall construction of Francia. That ceased to matter in 613 when God himself interceded in the civil wars that had fractured the land for over 50 years and laid waste to the kings of Austrasia and Burgundy, paving the way for Clothar to assume the role he coveted, king of all of the Franks. Actually, this last part was a bit of a misnomer. To say that God interceded on behalf of Clothar would certainly be saying what the king liked to think, but in reality, If God had interceded, then he had chosen the mayors of the palace to be the vessel through which he acted. These men had acted in concert, along with a handful of well-placed and highly influential nobles, to ensure that Clothar II was swept into power without too much blood being spilled in the process. 
They had come to loathe their queen, the once mighty Brunhilde, and were happy to replace the willful Visigothic woman with a Frankish man over whom they could exercise a certain amount of control. For ten years, as Clothar II styled himself King of the Franks, he found himself regularly struggling against his nobles and his clergy to maintain his God-given control and power of the kingdom, often with little success. In 614, only a year removed from his victory over the Visigothic queen, the nobles and the bishops had worked together to conjure up the Edict of Paris. This innocuous-sounding document actually attempted to codify the roles and responsibilities of the Franks' leadership, laying out in writing just what was expected of the nobles, the bishops, and, most importantly, of the king himself in securing the happiness and the peace of the realm. The bishops had tried to wrest the freedom to choose bishops away from Clothar, essentially allowing them to establish a second branch of government outside of the king's control. He'd been able to mitigate this to a degree, getting the bishops to agree that they would only consecrate bishops that he wanted. Still, they had won an incremental victory. Beyond this, they were also given the right to get rid of judges they didn't like, and also outlined a series of tax cuts and exemptions for the church. For the nobles' part, they were given the right to choose all of the holders of royal offices. They were allowed to kick out any Jews who were in their way, no matter if they were effective in their job or not, and replace them with people loyal and beholden to them. This power also extended to judges. Nobles were now allowed to appoint the legal experts they wanted for their own regions. Taking this power from the king and handing it to the nobles gave Clothar less ability to exert his influence. While all of these technical and legal shenanigans were going on, Clothar at least had the good fortune to be able to remove himself from the fray and spend time with his family. He'd been blessed with three sons, though the oldest of these, Merovec, had died years earlier while riding along on a military campaign. The remaining sons, Dagobert and Sharabert II, were growing strong, both in body and in faith, and it would only be a matter of time before these boys would be ready to rule in their own right. Now, normally, the partition of the Merovingian kingdom waited until the death of the king for his sons to take over their portions of the kingdom. However, Clothar was in a unique position, and this called for him to design and implement a unique response. His nobles had given him much in handing him power in 613, but they also took much for themselves by enacting the Edict of Paris in 614. Long story short, Clothar realized he had too much to worry about by being the king of the Franks without having someone he could trust helping him to administer his lands. And that's why, in 622, as Dagobert began his 20th year of life, his father decided it was time for him to be a king as well, even while his father yet lived. The region of Astrasia had long been a difficult place for Clothar to exercise control. It was the region that was once the home base of the Visigothic queen and had been resistant to the new king from the start, with its nobles at the forefront of those who would fight and argue with him over the extent of his power, and theirs. This made Astrasia the perfect location for Clothar to establish his son in his own court. The prince would gain experience in ruling, he would act as an extension of Clothar's royal power, and he would also provide a reminder to the nobles in that kingdom that they still answered to the crown a Merovingian crown. Well, the idea that Clothar was going for made sense, in theory. In practice, however, it ran into a few problems, the main thrust of which is that Dagobert, 20 years old and therefore invincible and all-knowing, wanted to be given full autonomy over how he ran Austrasia. He didn't need, nor did he want, to have to answer to his father or act as a co-ruler. This family spat, played out publicly, and it was only a matter of time before people outside of the Merovingians began to look at the situation as a way to benefit themselves. Chief amongst these ambitious outsiders was Duke Berthewald, leader of the Saxons. The Saxons were well known for being rebellious and war-hungry. Now, given a chance to act on this native instinct, they pulled together an army and some allies and turned their sights on Dagobert. This was just fine with the young king, actually. He loved the idea of a good, clean battle and wished to show himself, the world, and most importantly, 
his father, that he could rule his kingdom without help from anyone. He pulled together his army in response to the Saxons. He led them to the field of battle and then got his ass handed to him. You see, Dagobert figured he could just turn up and somehow, some way, his glorious, kingly presence would just inspire his men and make his enemies shake in their boots. Well, his presence definitely inspired the troops, just the wrong side. The Saxons, located on the east side of the Rhine, engaged Dagobert and his men as they came across the river, hitting them much harder than the Austrasians had expected. The Austrasians, undertrained and ill-led, did their best to survive the onslaught. Dagobert, fighting for his life with his army, entered into the thick of the battle and met with Saxons all too happy to be the one who would gain the honor of being the Kingslayer. Dagobert took on two at once, and while he fought with one, the other found an opening and struck the king directly in the head. The blow was so strong that the king's helmet went sailing, along with a sizable portion of his scalp. The blow didn't kill him, but head wounds being what they are, the blood ran down his face profusely. He was pulled from the field by his men, and the Austrasian army pulled back across the river Vesser, deep in Saxon territory. Dagobert's last order as he lost consciousness for that day was to his squire, Attila. Go quickly to my father, carry to him the piece of my head with all the hair, and tell him to hurry to help me before my whole army is killed. Attila did as ordered, and soon found Clothar and Longlier. The king, moved by the sight of his oldest son's scalp, instantly forgot all of the young man's transgressions, wanting to do nothing more than to save his boy. He had the horns and trumpets sounded. He assembled the whole of the Frankish army, and then moved night and day to get to the spot across the Rhine where Clothar convalesced. When the father, the son, and their two armies were united, the camp, dejected and preparing to die in the Saxon onslaught that was sure to come upon them at any moment, broke out in laughter and celebration. They were overjoyed at the prospect of possibly living through this calamity, and the sound of their relief could be heard across the river that separated the warring sides. Bertwald, the Duke of the Saxons, heard this noise and asked his scouts to report on what was happening. When they told him that King Clothar had come to save his son, and therefore the Austrasians were rejoicing, he scolded the troops. You're lying, he accused them. It isn't him because we've heard that he's dead, but you think it's him because you're so afraid of him. With that, Berthewald donned his armor and readied his army. They'd waited long enough already and squandered the momentum they had from the original battle. Now was the time to end this. He rode to the river and to prove to the scouts that they had misidentified King Clothar, the long-dead king of the Franks, he began to yell disrespectful taunts across the water of the sovereign he believed to be dead. Clothar, very much alive and very much in anger with the Saxons for daring to attack his kingdom and, most importantly, his boy, rode to the river and took off his helmet, allowing himself to be seen by the whole of the opposing side. His hair, now whitening with age, fell across his face when he removed his helmet. Bertuald, shocked that the king actually was there, now began to laugh when he saw the aged monarch. He'd already taken half the side of the younger king's head off. What hope did this geriatric old man have against him? He yelled at him, mocking his thinning and white hair. Are you there? Are you there, you old bald beast? Now, pride is a dangerous beast, especially when someone mocks it. The king, who had ridden hard for days, who had seen his bloodied son, and who had never spent a day in his life as anything other than the almighty sovereign, had no time and no desire to hear some plebiscite taunting him. He especially didn't need to hear these insults in front of all of his men and needed to respond to them lest he lose the respect of those who had followed him to war. He was in no mood to speak, however. Clothar was ready to fight. Right now. Before anyone realized what he was doing or could stop him, the king took his horse and galloped to the river. He entered the water in anger and swam the horse across, reaching the other side quickly. Bertuald, shocked by the king's readiness to battle him with so little thought, fell back with his men toward his army. The Franks, now inspired by their leader, quickly joined him. They crossed the Vesser. These men, 
half dead hours before, looked once again to be a dominant force. Clothar barely noticed his men coming behind him, so focused was he on catching this traitorous duke. He rode with a single-minded determination, every bit the son of Fredegunda, that wonderful queen who would cut anyone who stood her way in two. Catching up to Bertwald, he jumped from his horse and engaged the enemy commander in one-on-one combat, the soldiers of both sides watching this gladiatorial match between nobles take place right before their eyes. The matchup was Bertwald's to win. He was by far the younger fighter, and he was better rested than the king who had only just shown up to that battlefield. On top of all of this, Clothar was soaked from head to foot in the cold water of the Vesser, making every move he made harder, heavier, and slower. Still, he pressed the action, and whether from wounded pride, fatherly love, or simply from being that much better with a sword, the tide of the fight turned in favor of the king. Bertuald could feel this and tried to bargain with him as they circled against one another. Oh you, king, go back to your people so that I don't kill you by chance. For if you happen to kill me, it will be said that the great king Clothar killed one of his own servants. This argument meant nothing to the king. He fought on as if he had never heard him. Finally, in one great and valiant charge, clearly meant to end the talking, Clothar raised his sword to strike from above. Bertuald moved to block the blow, and did, but what he hadn't expected at this moment was the speed of the older king. While both of Bertuald's arms were raised in such a way so as to expose his chest, Clothar deftly dropped his right hand to his side and found his dagger. He pulled it out and jammed it into Bertuald's side in one smooth motion. The younger man instantly dropped his sword, his lung and intestines punctured. He fell to his knees. Clothar stood before Bertuald, savoring his victory over this arrogant young man. He spoke to him directly, but in a voice loud enough to be heard by all present. You dared to rise against my son, and in doing so you rose against me and the whole of Francia. Now you, and everyone who joined you, shall pay the penalty for your intransigence. My orders are thus. We shall enter into Saxony and lay waste to the whole of your country with fire. Then, to ensure we don't have to concern ourselves with yet another rebellion by your faithless tribe, I decree that no male heirs are to be left alive who are taller than the length of a sword. With your land on fire and no one to reproduce your people, your fall from grace will serve as a testament to the courage and power of the Franks. And you, Bertuald, shall be the first to suffer this punishment. With that, Clothar swung down strong and hard with his sword, severing Bertuald's head from his body in one stroke. He reached down and picked up the decapitation, holding it aloft as he turned to his forces. You've heard my judgment. Now, carry out the punishment. The Saxon forces, seeing their fallen leader and hearing the order given for their genocide, retreated hastily from the battlefield. Many grabbed their families and left the continent, happy to take their chances on a little-known island to the north, rather than facing the might of the Franks here in the south. They joined another tribe, the Angles, in their flight north, and eventually joined in battle against the Bretons. For now, however, the Saxons' time as a contending tribe came to an end. They fled or they were killed, and what was left was absorbed by the conquerors. The Saxons' time as a tribe wasn't finished, but with the fall of Bertuald and the victory of Clothar and Dagobert, their days on the mainland were numbered. This is Thugs and Miracles. Season 2, Episode 2 Single Combat Alright, welcome back. I'm Benjamin Bernier, and this week we're taking a look inward at the politics of the Merovingians post-613, post the execution of Brunhilde, and post the reunification of the three Frankish kingdoms of this time, Austrasia, Burgundy, and Neustria. 
under a single king. As we saw last week, there were plenty of external forces and players involved in making this reunification possible, and each of these players wanted their own piece of the action for having handed Clothar the ultimate prize. That's important, but what's equally important to examine is the internal dynamics of the Merovingian kings. In this case, as I said in the story, Clothar struggled to hold together the various regions of his empire, and this makes sense given the sheer size of the landmass under his control and the lack of effective communications. These two issues led kings to rely heavily on proxies to handle their business. Usually this meant a duke such as Bertuald, or, as we saw in episode 1, the mayors of the palace. And given that these people were not always as loyal to the king as the king might like, it made sense for him to hire from within, so to speak. Enter Dagobert. The partition of the Merovingian dynasty between Dagobert and Clothar II was one of the first times that we've seen a king willingly split his territory for any reason, and for what it's worth, I can at least see where Clothar was trying to go with this decision. If we look back at earlier examples of post-death kingdom inheritance and splitting, Clovis took control of his father's empire without having to fight among siblings for control and this had a huge impact on his ability to focus on expansion, whereas most other sovereigns that we've talked about had to deal with infighting. Fast forward to his death in 511, and the sons of Clovis spent the next 47 years fighting with one another in some way, shape, or form for the title of King of the Franks. Clothar I won this battle, basically by outliving his brothers, but only held the title for three years before he died, and the whole process repeated itself. Anyway, forget all of the names that are in play here and focus on one central idea. Over 100 years passed, 100 years, from the death of Clovis that began the whole internal squabble up until our point in the history right now. And I can kind of understand why a king such as Clothar II would find it prudent to groom a successor before he died. Every king has to deal with succession, whether he wants to or not, and it seems that Clothar II was particularly mature about this. He set aside Astrasia for his crown prince, a move that Ian Wood concedes, quote, might be seen as a concession to regional forces and an admission that the Merovingian kingdom could never be truly united. However, it is important to stress the fact that the Merovingian family remained central to the political structure of Francia. End quote. Long story short, the partition can be viewed as having happened for a handful of reasons, but all of those reasons still allowed for a Merovingian king to remain in charge of the Frankish kingdoms. The aristocratic families were not looking to be the ultimate power, yet, but happily served as the power to the throne. We saw Garnier do this with Clotho II last week in Neustria, and now we're going to see the same happen with Arnulf and Pippin. Both of these men were willing to betray Brunhilde for the political gain of Clothar, and here we see them repaid by becoming the chief advisors to a new king in their home region of Astrasia. Clothar got to repay his backers with this move, ensured the line of succession was uncontested as staying in Merovingian hands, and gave his boy a chance to ride his new bike with training wheels, so to speak, rather than being forced to learn how to ride all at once when his dad died as so often happened in monarchical governments. Honestly, from his perspective, it seems to me to be a win-win-win. So, if all of this was the case, and Clothar II was so smart, then what happened in 622? Well, there's two things to keep in mind. First off, the two sources that offer us a near-term look at the fight between Clothar and Bertwald come from the Liber Estori Francorum, or the L.A. Jeff for short, and the Gesta de Gaberte, written about 100 and 200 years after the events in question, respectively. As we've noted about sources in this time period, sources were written by relatively smart people who had access to the resources necessary to put pen to paper in a time when both pens and paper were not common items. These people were therefore often beholden to certain authorities and they would have reason to skew events in a way that makes their benefactors look the best. We saw this concept in the most glaring way when we talked about Brunhilde. Gregory of Tours, who lived under her rule and who had access to her frequently, wrote about her like she was the greatest thing since sliced bread, whereas the Chronicles of Fredegar, written well after her death at the hands of Clothar, 
tended to classify her as something of a Wicked Witch-style character. Anyway, the reason for bringing this up again is to bring into relief just how the LHF and the Gesta Dagoberti likely skewed the story to make the Saxons sound worse than they were, and to make Clothar sound that much more amazing. Does this mean he didn't ford a river in front of an enemy army, chase down its commander, engage in single combat, and then give an order to slaughter an entire race? Well, I guess he could have gone all Jon Snow on the Saxons, but let's be realistic. The more likely story is that elements of the story are true, and the end result was the same. Basically, trusting the LHF and the Gesta Dagoberti as the quote-unquote true story in all of the details of what actually happened is probably about as accurate as watching that same episode of Game of Thrones that I just referenced to learn about how the Romans lost to Hannibal at Cannae. The second thing to keep in mind is that the Saxon response to Dagobert's ascendancy seems fairly rational. Again, sources claim the Saxons had been paying tribute to the Franks at the rate of 400 cows a year. If they were sick of paying tribute, and if they sensed the weakness in the rise of a 20-year-old, untested king, and if they were tired of the Franks pushing their hegemony into their territory as well, well, 622 would seem as good a time as any to revolt. At the same time, Clothar's reaction to their revolt seems era-appropriate. Given the need to keep multiple tribes and ethnic groups in line, as well as the need to make examples with which to send a message in this time of slow communications, laying waste to an entire tribe who would dare to stand against the Merovingians, while hurling insults at them no less, doesn't seem entirely surprising. This also could serve as an example of creative destruction, wherein the destruction of the Saxons may have spurred them to move out of the area faster than they would have done so naturally, thereby increasing the number of refugees crossing the channel over to Britain and altering the migration patterns that would affect that island. But honestly, to say that is to give short shrift to any number of other factors that could have driven Saxon migration, to include poor crop yields, encroachment from other tribes, and moving to a land of opportunity that other Saxons had been traveling to for well over 150 years at that point. All of this is to say that yes, the stories of Frankish and Saxon wars are likely true. It's entirely possible that all three of them, Dagobert, Clothar, and Bertwald, were involved in the fighting. And it's likely true that the Saxons lost and suffered greatly as a result all of the rest of the details simply make for a great story, albeit one that's best to be taken as a bit of myth-making for the Merovingian kings, as opposed to the gospel truth. Okay, we'll leave it off there for today. Dagobert is in the driver's seat of his own kingdom, even if he had to rely on Daddy to come and beat up on the bully that was pushing him around for this to happen. Eventually, though, Dagobert was going to have to learn to fight for himself or at least fight better, as the case may be, because Clothar II couldn't live forever. And that's what we're going to go in the next episode. We're going to really take a look at Dagobert and the almost diametrically opposed biographies that exist for his reign. Was he le bon roi Dagobert, the good and wise king? Or was he a lustful, lecherous, and base man whose advisors struggled to keep him in check? The struggle to craft his image and his legacy almost reminds me of a certain current president, all of which reminds me of a famous quote attributed to Mark Twain. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Beyond Dagobert, we'll also say bon voyage to Clothar II. His life, starting from his time as a prop for Fredegunda and lasting through all of the changes he made to the monarchy, both good and bad, is worthy of a significant eulogy, and we'll offer that to him next week. As a final note for today, and as an attempt to wrap everything up with a nice bow, I want to point out that, one week in 2011 years prior to the drop date of this podcast, on 9 September 9, or 999, for those who like their history to have a bit of a numerical alliteration, an alliance of Germanic tribes ambushed three Roman legions traveling in the rain through the story Teutoburg Forest, which today sits in the German state of Lower Saxony. That's right. 500 years before Dagobert and Clothar II spilled the blood of the Saxons along the banks of the Rhine, the German tribes predating both the Franks and the Saxons were busy spilling the blood of the Roman soldiers in nearly the exact same spot. 
These Germans took the heads of the several thousand Roman soldiers killed and put them on pikes for everyone to see. We're told that skulls would be spotted on pikes in the forest for the next hundred years. This battle, led by a Roman defector named Arminius, effectively marked the end of Roman military expansionism across the Rhine River and into Germanic territories. And of course, not quite 2,000 years later, Patton would lead his forces back across France and into Germany, crossing, again, at nearly the same point. People just can't seem to get enough of spilling blood into the Rhine, and it's amazing to think that for most of recorded history, we found a reason to do exactly that. Anyway, Stephen DeJulius, of Patton fame from the start of this episode, has also done an excellent episode on Arminius. And if you're looking for another listen, check out any and all of his episodes now. The links, as always, are in the show notes, and also on the Thugs and Miracles website on the recommendations page. Alright, as always, the music used for the show comes from Josh Woodward, and it includes his songs, Bully and Lafayette. For a free download of these songs or hundreds of other great tracks, check out his site at joshwoodward.com. Notes on this episode, a list of sources, an updated monarchy slash family tree, and also a list of other great history podcasts are all available online at thugsandmiracles.com. Be sure to sign up for our free email list so I can keep you up to date with all things TNM. Speaking of email, you can write to us at thugsandmiracles at gmail.com. You can hit us on Twitter at thugsandmiracle with no S on the end. Or you can leave a comment on Facebook and Instagram at Thugs and Miracles. Finally, if you have a chance and you feel moved, please take a moment to rate and review the show. It's a great feeling in a podcaster's day to see kind words and five stars, and we hope that you'll take the time to do just that. Okay, once again, my name is Benjamin Bernier, and I look forward to seeing you in 10 more days as we finish looking at Clothar II and really dive into Dagobert in our next episode of Thugs and Miracles. <laughs>